So good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome again to our second presentation um, in our Critical Issues in STEM uh, Education Speaker Series. Um, again, I am Christopher Wright, Assistant Professor in STEM Education here at Drexel, and I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Um, prior to um, that, that introduction, um, if you have any questions um, during the um, during the presentation, please uh, feel free to enter those into the chat, um, and we can. Um, and and this is more of a conversation from what I'm being told, so um, please don't worry about that, and just enter the uh, questions, and then we will offer them up at that time also as well. Okay. So again, um, today's speaker, um, Dr. Grace Perez, is the McDonald uh, Family Assistant Professor in Engineering Education at Tufts University. She is, an, she is an engineer, learning scientist, and educator who received her PhD in science education and learning sciences from Stanford University. Her scholarship specializes in the interdisciplinary study of language and cognition with students who may experience a cultural and linguistic mismatch between the practices of their communities and those in engineering and science. In addition to her work on culturally relevant learning through emerging technologies, she uses mixed methodologies to investigate the strengths that multi-competent individuals whose lives exist between languages and or cultures might be able to contribute to the social fabric. Her mission is to expand who is heard and can contribute to the disciplines as society demands professionals with backgrounds as diverse as the challenges we face. And so at this time, again, I would like to welcome and hand this over to Dr. Perez. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Chris, uh, and thank you for this invitation. I am I'm very excited to, to be here in, um, in, in honor. I've heard so much about Drexel and, and the community there. So this is, this is truly a pleasure. And like you mentioned, this is meant to be a conversation. Uh, so virtual uh, presentations can be a bit awkward. Uh, and uh, I will leave uh, after certain number of slides and awkward pause uh, waiting in case that you have any reactions or any questions uh, and feel free just to unmute yourself and jump in at any time. Uh, I really don't mind. I actually highly encourage you to do it if you feel inclined to do so. Um, let me see. And if by any reason you are not hearing or seeing any of the slides, uh, please let me know. Um, some of the videos are really low in volume because there are children speaking. Um, and I will show you the transcriptions after the video has passed. Um, can you see the slides? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, I, I don't see the, no, a, any of your faces, so that, a, yeah, so just feel free to let me know. Um, so again, I'm going to share with you a lot of my work in why language matters in engineering and science with a focus primarily in engineering. Um, and I want to start presenting um, to you or showing to you two common narratives that we are told or that are shared out there about language um, in general. So one of them is language as a problem to be overcome, um, where entire populations of people uh, undergo certain forms of education with the sole goal of acculturating them to the dominant English um, ways of speaking, the standardized ways of speaking, and this is seen as a problem and a challenge uh, for educational attainments. Um, the other narrative is the one that portrayed language as a power, uh, as bilinguals, as two monolinguals inside one mind, a power that a very few hold. And what I want to share with you is that even though these two narratives sound dramatically different, they both have something in common. And it's this idea of the power of language. One, the problem to be overcome, alienate 
an incomplete populations of speakers and, and, and knowers. And the other one, basically um, making exceptionalizing other groups of speakers. And what we need to ask here is who do we consider typically under these narratives a problem to be overcome? And who are the people who have access to be seen, their language practices to be seen as a power and uh, as something, something exceptional? And I learned very early on, way before I started my PhD, about many of these dynamics, particularly the one around language as a problem to be overcome. When I was an elementary bilingual teacher in Texas, um, where the language resources of many of my students were seen as a roadblock for the, their success. And here I'm showing you Jose, Luis, and Alberto, and these are pseudonyms. Um, and they were uh, some of my students who after a school engaged in engineering design activities um, and without me knowing exactly what I was doing, we were engaging in mixing language practices. So expressing their ideas in any way that they felt comfortable and that felt right for them. Uh, because the goal was not to acculturate, it, acculturate them to particular ways of talking in that moment, but actually to get them excited about science and engineering and to develop a conceptual understanding of their ideas um, behind all of, the cons all of the activities that they were doing. So here they are um, engaging in creating, in testing different materials uh, for creating uh, sculptures. Um, and at that time, uh, these students were seen as deficient, as not having enough language to actually engage in engineering and science. Um, and as many of you may know, if you have experiences in uh, schools, um, students typically are pulled out of the classrooms um, to, to, to receive uh, additional language support. And that is often at the cost of them not being able to participate in science and engineering activities in the classroom. And I'm happy to say that uh, these students were from being labeled language deprived to actually winning the science fair um, with, a, with a fully a Spanish uh, poster in the design of a sac a puntas, a, a pencil sharpener that was going to make the lab um, more efficient, the multiple trips that a students will do to the trash can uh, um, and that were often a roadblock or, or, or were often uh, attention distractions um, to, the, to the activities happening in the classroom. So they uh, created a portable uh, pencil sharpener that could be um, attached to the clothing and that students didn't have to go all the time uh, to the trash can. And again, just like the students engaged in these hybrid language practices um, and use the resources that they um, understood and knew to be true in their communities at the moment, even though they were seen their language practices were seen as a problem to be overcome. Their language practices actually became the way or the mechanism for them to have access or, or to make sense of science and engineering ideas in the classroom. But they were not given the opportunity to see themselves as having certain kind of access to different communities like many other people have access to, to, to be seen as exceptional, as, as having all of these uh, language uh, competencies. And we see these kinds of dynamics of power around language, not only in elementary classrooms. So we see it uh, in big tech and how the language resources of entire populations like the Maori have been under um, a contentious debate because um, companies are trying to harness the language resources of these communities and, and basically patent them uh, for development of technologies. We also see it uh, in policy and implementation of new ways or, of pedagogical practices 
where black populations are in many cases forced to standardize their ways of speaking when these things can coexist and we could actually focus on the development of the conceptual ideas behind science and engineering. We also see language, the power of language in politics and how many conflicts are started or justified on the basis of language. And lastly, we see it in technology where many uh, technology companies uh, in, in, in the virtual reality in particular, um, they are inviting us to defy the reality, to go out of a space, to a speak like someone different, instead of being inspired by the realities of our communities and inspired by the ways of knowing and speaking of people that we know so that kids can make that connection between science and engineering and their daily lives. Um, I'm gonna stop there uh, and do like one of these awkward pauses in case someone has any uh, pressing thoughts to share. Okay, I will reiterate to please jump in at any time. So we have a dual responsibility. Teachers have a dual responsibilities and professors in this context um, of developing scientific uh, and technical knowledge and at the same time um, develop the literacy competencies uh, from, uh, for students. Um, but then we have this challenge that a lot of the teachers and professors are often coming from a cultural and linguistic background that is different from those of their students. And many of these expectations and responsibilities that are imposed into, into teachers are coming uh, from a lot of the frameworks uh, for science and engineering at the K through 12 and in higher education. And there are there very, very clear expectations for students uh, to develop uh, disciplinary uh, knowledge and practices, but also at the same time to communicate these ideas in particular ways. Um, and a lot of my work is um, just reiterating that we need to place more emphasis on the conceptual, on, on, the, on the conceptual understanding of a lot of the ideas in engineering and science and that, that we need to allow students to express these ideas in ways that feel authentic to them. But in order to do that, we need to better understand what are the affordances of allowing students to bring the language resources from their communities into these scientific and technical environments and how, what are the assumptions that we are taking when we are doing these kinds of, of work? So I like to talk about my work as a form of utopia, of imagining what could we do, what is possible if we bridge the worlds that students live outside of a school with the worlds that they live in science and engineering. So that takes me to this question, what makes learning environment environments equitable for these kinds of students that have a diversity of cultural and linguistic backgrounds. And I know this looks very overwhelming, but I will walk you through each of these findings. Um, so basically there are a standard norms of how people talk and how people see the languages. So in society, we have hierarchies of uh, ways of uh, speaking and assumptions that people make about the way that people talk. Um, the second finding is that audience plays a crucial role in influencing the way that others um, use their language, particularly in science and engineering. And the third finding is giving us some initial finding, initial um, resources to think about what are some ways that we can actually invite students to bring the knowledge of their communities into the engineering work. 
So the, for the first finding, the standard norms and how standard norms influence how students see themselves and view their language resources as the speakers. Um, we, will, we will look at um, a study that I run a few years ago, primarily with K through 12 students. And in, I'm not gonna go very deep into the theory and mostly show you pieces of, um, of, of data that were collected in these studies. Um, and what I found is that just because we make opportunities available, that doesn't mean that students are gonna take those opportunities. So, <coughs> apologies. <coughs> Just because we think that we are reimagining and we are explicit, um, just as I have been doing since we started this conversation, I have explicitly said, please interject at any time, but not because I allow that or give permission to participants to do so. We all know that there are certain norms in these kinds of, of environments that are difficult to overcome because we have been socializing those norms. Um, and it happens the same with the students. Just because we tell them, say it in any way that feels comfortable to you doesn't mean they are going to do it. And when they are using their language, there are factors beyond us giving them permission that are influencing how they use language and how they see it. So for the first study, again, I am drawing on, a theory, on the theory of translanguaging which is basically um, to investigate how students interact with these uh, science ideas. Um, and translanguaging is a social justice uh, theory and pedagogy that actually proposes to free the bilingual child from thinking about that here there's English and here there's a Spanish. So translanguaging is a theory and pedagogy that is actually challenging the idea of languages as separate systems, because it believes that that's not reflective of, of actually the ways that people live the language in their communities. And the way that I uh, went about studying these ideas was with a small sample of bilingual students um, in, in mostly in elementary and in early middle school. Um, and the students participated in, in three different lessons. One of them, the first one, the translanguaging one, um, they could mix the languages. <coughs> they, were, they, were, they were having teachers who model for them language mixing. Um, in other words, someone will start talking like I'm doing right now, y de, y de repente empiezan a hablar con, con el otro idioma. And then the ideas were presented like that, switching back and forth between English and Spanish. Um, and that was a focus on alternative energies. And then the second lesson was also on engineering design and was focusing on magnetic levitation. And the last one in water on water treatment in English only. And these were all problems that were contextualized in particular needs of communities in Northern California, where most of these uh, children have spent uh, most of their uh, academic life. <clears throat> um, I audio and video recorded uh, many of uh, the students are participating in these lessons and then I interview them after the fact. And then the, what you will see here are uh, three of the students. Uh, we don't see the, the, the third one, Valeria, Kila, and Camila talking with uh, Mrs. Stephanie. Um, and they are in this moment waiting for one of the fans to test their designs of windmills. So they were, they were in the alternative uh, energies, uh, engineering design, and this lesson was meant to be mixing both English and Spanish. All of the students, except for Valeria, that you don't see at the moment in this video, attended dual language schools in the United States. So they have formal education, both in Spanish and in English. Yet, even though we provided them with opportunities to mix languages, they refrain throughout the entire um, activity to do so. And very randomly, where we are waiting for the fans, for them to test their, their, their windmill blades, 
um, they started talking about uh, punishment tools that are used in schools to control their behavior. And particularly one of those behaviors is their language practices. Um, so the video is very low volume, um, but pay attention and then I will show you the um, transcription of what they said. <coughs> So you're saying that like when they show a color, that tells you what language you speak in your classroom? Yeah. So, oh, I get it. So, when you, when you okay, have to go put your we camera. have to speak. So there's this chart. Okay, so so notice how Camila talk about we speak Spanish, we speak at least one word in English, and then you have to change your pen to green. And notice how she starts separating herself as soon as she's describing the negative behaviors. So what Camila is describing here is a behavior chart. Um, and if you haven't uh, heard before about it, it's just a color chart. And then there is a pin that uh, kids need to change depending on their behavior. So she's describing throwing a block or being mean to other people or speaking in English during the Spanish lesson as equal with not being good to others or hurting, physically hurting other people. And she continued describing that if these behaviors continue, then you need to change your pen to red and then you go back home. So how Camila is actually equating the dexterity of mixing languages and actually being able to navigate between languages as something negative and frowned upon in the classroom. So of course, even though we provided these opportunities to engage in this uh, summer uh, program, to engage in both languages and actually bring them together to make sense of the engineering activities, um, these students did not take these opportunities because they understood there was a bigger, a broader social context that had very clear expectations about what were the acceptable ways to use language. Any thoughts? Uh, so far. <laughs> Your modification charts make me crazy. <laughs> Would you please repeat? This, this idea of having a kid be having all of the students in the class be able to see this behavior chart for children is just it blows my mind in the grand scheme of things. But also when you connect it to the language they're using, it's just insane. Yeah. Yeah, so punitive yeah. for no reason. Yeah. And, so, and notice, notice how at the end, Camila said, you know, it's not so bad. You just need to take down your choices and make good choices. So how kids have internalized this to a place where they feel that this is their responsibility to be policing themselves? So for, for clarity, is this, they were not allowed to speak Spanish? Is that what I'm understanding? So for a, 
um, in the, the, they were participating in this program that again, I, as I said at the beginning, I call a lot of my work utopia because they, these things don't exist in schools. Right. And, and that's why I created these spaces outside of a school to see how children will behave. Um, and, and when I create these spaces where they could do what I'm going to do in a second, which is to speak in one way y después moverse para el otro idioma, and then come back to the next language in whichever way they feel more comfortable, they didn't do it um, because they explain, and this is what Camila is explaining here, that in schools, even though these are dual language schools that are meant to um, educate children in both languages, the separation between languages is so strict that they equate mixing them with uh, these kinds of behaviors. So they, they need to stay, for example, speaking English in particular times of the day or particular lessons, or even they declare, for instance, science and engineering English only. So kids have been are punished if they try to cross the boundaries and then bring some Spanish when that time is presumably being exclusive for English. Um, and this yeah. is just not how people speak and behave. Exactly. Thanks for the clarity, now I get yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Um, so then we have another student, um, which is Lionel. Um, and Lionel um, actually gave us uh, initial um, ideas on what factors other than, you know, creating this a, a imaginary environments where people can mix any way of speaking to make sense of science and engineering idea, what things matter in these situations? And I want, in this, in this particular case, Lionel was working in the Spanish only lesson and we were um, developing a magnetic levitation train uh, to solve some of the challenges uh, with traffic and public transportation in Northern California. And, and notice how uh, Leonel starts uh, explaining his ideas in the language that is expected of him. Um, and then notice how he reacts to offers from different um, facilitators, adult facilitators, um, to use um, the proper uh, air quotes uh, word in Spanish for magnets, which is imanes, um, and how he reacts when Mrs. Mrs. Rojas um, invites him to say it in any way that feels right to him. Magnets. Magnets. Y, um, no teníamos suficientes Iman. 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 Un ma magne aquí y uno aquí y luego um, y luego um, dilo como pueda que, que como te salga bien so when you put it from this side it's, it gets stuck but when you put it from that side so I will put that side and this side right here so it can float and put it right here so and put lots more okay. so it can be floating over the magnets and ¿Y cómo lo vas a hacer que se mueva hacia adelante? con muchos magnets y con mucho tape porque um, lo puedo pisar o 
So notice how when the adult facilitator offered the word in Spanish, imanes, he refuses to use the word imanes. And his brother, uh, um, Gio, who is also there and we cannot see in the video, offered the word magnetos multiple times. Um, so there were other dynamics in addition to us providing these opportunities for language mixing in the classroom that were influencing how Lionel was using the language. And notice how when Mrs. Rojas says, say it, say it in any way that makes sense to you, how he actually crossed the boundaries between languages and the dexterity of him using con muchos, con muchos magnets and con mucho tape, porque lo puedo puchar así. So how he takes an, in, an English construction, a, a chunk, a word that would be considered English, and he basically um, uh, used uh, the gender, the correct gender and plural form of that to make it into a Spanish. So that tells us that they have a, a great awareness of how the language works and how they can bring together these, uh, these ideas into, make, into, into explaining uh, the reasoning behind their designs. Any any thoughts before we move on or any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this is Frederica Reisman. Uh, I was wondering where motivation comes in. Is there any focus on uh, strategies to motivate the youngsters to uh, speak in Spanish when answering and not feeling that they must speak in English. It seems to me that motivation is involved here. Okay, can you, can you tell me more about that? Uh, do you mean motivation if we provided any motivation for them to do it? Or um, what are some ways that we can uh, formally do it? If you, if you can tell me more about that. Uh, yes, uh, Teresa Amaboli focuses on intrinsic motivation, mm -hmm. and um, and and says that well, she she focuses on creativity and developing creative products, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking with with the children, uh, if they were uh, to get a lot of positive feedback when they were speaking. Spanish in answering questions uh, and, and not so much positive feedback when they would answer in English, if that might be a variable. Yeah. Um, the answer is that it could be. Um, and the, the answer is, I, and I'm sorry because I answer a lot of questions with this, but the answer is that I really don't know. Um, but I think a, a piece of information that I think is important to understand is that kids have a tremendous awareness of what we socially expect them to do with language. Um, and language is some, something that has become so fascinating to me because it's all around, it's pervasive, and we rarely think about it. Um, and we have all of these messages from TV, from social media, from other people around us um, that tell us what are forms of speaking that are valuable in our society, that tell us who are the people for whom being bilingual is a power. Um, so which context and for, who, for whom is bilingualism an asset? Um, and, and kids are very, at a very young age, they develop an understanding of those expectations. And it is difficult for me to think that only intrinsic motivation will do the trick. Um, because at the end, we all want to be heard. We all want to be, um, we all want to contribute. And if we know that the expectation out there for us to be heard and to contribute is to acculturate, it may be to ask too much of the students 
um, to say, you know, develop your intrinsic self and you're gonna go there. I, I think that that will be a disservice to many students who, um, who may have uh, intentions and the desire to, to express ideas in other ways, yet they don't have the avenues because there's, there's a social, eco there's the ecology of the classroom, of the schools, of the communities. Every state, believe it or not, have a different language policy in the United States. Um, in states as progressive as California just recently, um, basically decriminalized bilingualism in public schools. And in where I'm currently, I am at the moment, bilingual education to the best of my understanding is not necessarily an option in bilingual schools. And if it is, it's mostly for the advancement of a standard ways of speaking. So long story short, this is, this is, this is, um, this is social, the social cultural context in which all of these things happen require us to think in more systemic and structural ways around language. And the diversity of language experiences that are shaped by where students are located geographically in the communities they are um, also demands from us that there's not a single solution to this challenge. So each community will have particular needs and in, in, in nuances that we need to account. Um, we, we like to think that Latinx people or uh, Black communities, African-American communities, indigenous communities in the United States are this monolith, uh, but they are as diverse uh, they, they are so diverse in, in terms of culture and language. And, and I think try to find a single solution that will address all of, all of their particular context will be to do a disservice to, to them. I think I, I went like way over or beyond your question, but. No, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, are you familiar with self-determination theory? I am as familiar as anyone who has some kind of education, but I won't call myself an expert. Well, because I think that there's a relationship um, between that uh, focus where the, the emphasis is um, enabling the child to self-determine mm -hmm. what they want to learn, what they want to be, how, how they want to act, it's also related to the unschooling environment that is uh, getting more and more popular. But Ryan and Desi, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I just see a connection between that motivation theory and what you're trying to accomplish or what you are accomplishing. Yeah, I, I would love to hear more about it. I, 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 I am not, like I said, I'm not an expert on it and, and I would love to learn more about it and how they are seeing it. Um, the, 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 I think the major um, challenge slash opportunity that I see is that um, it, it took me decades, for example, to my, myself to think um, as a, as a well-educated person, uh, confident um, to overcome the need, for instance, to change my accent or to refrain from speaking in the ways that is my communities speak in, in academic context. And I can only imagine the unsurmountable effort that will take for students to go against, um, you know, a lot of people in positions of power and a lot of environments around them that are telling them exactly the opposite, mm -hmm. that are telling them you have to speak in this way to be successful. Um, and 
And, you know, bilingual people or people who are socialized in other ways of speaking outside of a school, we sometimes just switch and we don't even think about the context in the moment. Um, and, and so I think it will take an unsurmountable effort from the person. And, and I think if we find instances in which people do it, I think those are going to be the exception and not the rule. Um, but I, I'll be curious to, to talk more about it with you. Uh, Dr. Perez, uh, what I find really interesting is that historically, we have always looked to students uh, uh, to be the solution that it's their problem. They need, mm -hmm. they need to make the changes necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what you've been talking about the really the political nature of how bilingual education, dual language instructional programs have been really turned into political, uh, I guess, uh, and mm -hmm. polarizing uh, uh, ways to talk about education. And, 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 and when I think about why children don't utilize their mother tongue, it's because politically and socially, we've created a deficit model that has impacted these children to the point that they don't feel that confidence or uh, the strength to be able to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. And that then begs to where the problem lies, which is what can institutions and teachers do to, to make the change that is necessary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who, who, who's speaking? Uh, Jose uh, Chavez. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Jose. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. And, and I, I happen to, most of my work happened to be situated within Spanish speaking Latinx communities. But if we think about all of the other people who, are not quote unquote a standard English speakers, rural communities in the United States, indigenous communities, African American and Black communities in the United States, and overall people who don't grow up speaking the ways that scientists and engineers speak, and how we are expecting them to acculturate uh, to these ways of talking. Um, and, and I'm wondering, do we really want them to make sense of these ideas and make meaningful connections to their lived reality so they can translate those ideas beyond their local context and, and also find a meaningful application of those ideas in their local context? Um, so even though uh, I'm focusing on a particular population, I, I think these ideas and experiences with their nuances are, are things that we need to be thinking about and more broadly. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, so just for the sake of time, I will, I will continue so we at least get to, uh, to do um, um, show you a lot of other pieces of information. I will try because of the time to go over um, them. O until what time do we have, um, Chris? Around 1105. Okay, so I will hurry up. Um, so then um, the next, uh, this study just uh, took me into analyzing what are other factors that people consider other than us creating this utopia where people can mix languages. What else matters for students? And what I found, um, okay, so what else matters for students? And I also wanted to know because one can only do a PhD once and it was my time to play with ideas at the moment was what would happen later on in life? Um, so I took the learnings from this first, study that I just show you and apply it in an undergraduate context and try to create the same utopia 
in an environment where we don't typically offer bilingual education to students or education that is in non-dominant languages. And what I found is that a factor that was decisive in how students use the language was the audience. So who professors are in terms of racial, cultural, and language identity influence actually how students use their language in particular contexts. And I will explain to you how I tested uh, this idea. Um, so if you look at the top row, um, I ask a bunch of questions to a students, a battery of almost 50 questions, where I ask them how would they use language depending on the place, the audience, and the topic. And I ask these questions to more than um, 500 students, but I only focus my analysis on 196 Latinx undergraduates who were majoring in a STEM and who were born and or raised in the United States and have had their lives, their schooling in the US. So we are not talking about international students or anything like that. We are talking about people who have spent most of their academic lives in the US. And I analyzed this data from the language survey um, using different uh, quantitative analysis. And that's the first part of the study, which is like the darker boxes on the top. And I will tell you more about the bottom in a few. And these are some of the questions. So I asked them simple questions like the one on the top where I presented different places. So it was either their home or their university. And they were talking to different people like their professors or their parents. And they were either talking about math and science or about family topics, such as how a son and daughter should behave. And they needed to rank in a liquor scale, how would they speak in these situations? So from only English to only Spanish. I also asked questions that were more complex. So that added some situations for in, like the one on the bottom. And these situations were about feelings or about talking with someone from their same racial or language background or to make jokes um, or to, to have other situations and to actually see what were the things that were driving students to talk in particular ways. Um, and the underlying idea beyond all of this was this learning that I had from the previous study that making opportunities available, it just doesn't do the trick only. Um, and having a seat at the table, like it is popularly said, is not enough in science and engineering. So what I found is that overwhelm overwhelmingly, audience play a crucial role in how students decided to select their language in these questions. And then the next um, very important influential um, uh, factor was topic and then place. But all of the influence of topic and place comes actually from associations with particular audiences. So audience is unsurmountable, more influential than anything. And any influence that a place like the university or a topic like engineering and science have comes from the people who represent those fields and those particular contexts. And I just wanna pause there and invite you to imagine who are the typical teachers and faculty in engineering and science. And once you take that imagination route, think about what are the kinds of messages that students receive about who can contribute and who is heard in engineering and science and what are the ways that they can make those contributions. So when I took the data, um, the means for audience, um, and I want you to follow me on this, uh, um, hopefully I will do an okay job um, explaining. Notice that when it is professors here, notice that when it is professors, when we load the factors to STEM, the topic and university, so all of them related to science and engineering, 
is when we get the highest scores of all, meaning that students are speaking, are more likely to speak in English when they are in situations where the audience aligns with what they associate the audience to be talking about and the context in which this audience talks about these topics. And before I continue, um, notice how on the bottom, there's an, a methodological manipulation that I did. So there's this scale where two is only English and minus two is only Spanish and zero is speaking both languages. This is not a value judgment of language practices. It's a me methodological manipulation to be able to better understand this data that, um, that is quite complex. Um, so notice how on the other side, when it's parents, students tended to mix more languages and the factors load and parents are actually the dominant uh, factor in how they use language, even at the university, even when they are talking about science and, and, and engineering. And for some reason, I don't see my cursor now. One second. So these are after after we analyze all of the data where we clearly saw that parents are influencing how they use languages or audiences influencing how they use language in and outside of a school. Um, we ask students, we presented this data to students and asked them to make sense of them. Um, and a lot of the things that students share were um, the lack of representations of faculty of color. And if someone would like to volunteer and read some of the quotes that I will present, uh, I would really appreciate that. I'll help you out, Dr. Thank Brent. you. <laughs> So this one is professors and the lack of representation of faculty of color. Quote, in STEM, especially engineering, almost all, if not all, professors don't speak other languages. Outside of engineering, I have had professors who speak to me in both languages. Why can't engineering education do it? It has to do with the audience. English is the language in engineering, end quote. Thank you so much. So look how students are making sense of these, this data by saying, we don't have professors like that. So we cannot imagine something that doesn't exist. But even if they exist, Bobby is telling us that Latinx professors would not engage in these practices and they would not signal to them that it is okay to speak in other ways. Carla even tell us that Latinx professors are some kind of mythical, legendary figure, that they don't exist, that they haven't had any Latinx professor who speak a, a Spanish, and they blame that at the demographics of professors. Um, Leila, which is another a student, um, narrates her interactions with scientists at NASA um, and how they didn't interact in other ways of speaking. Number one, because they were engineering the rubber, which is so detached to communities and to people. And because Spanish, like she said in the last sentence, is seen as less professional. And she's associating the idea of a nation state of the United States with speaking only English. So again, the audience, who are we having as professors and teachers in science and engineering have a direct influence on the language use? Because we are um, almost out of time, I don't want to leave you with, uh, with, uh, with the last part of it. And I, I will quickly show um, the last study, which is that I took these uh, learnings um, and I actually, created language opportunities that align with the language 
of the communities where students came from. And what I found is that students brought cultural values associated with their communities when they were allowed to speak in ways that aligned with their local context. And to give you an example, imagine that the near context is the engineering activity. And the distal context is a Latinx, a Spanish speaking community. So I use language and a person like myself who is bilingual, who's a woman of color in engineering to signal to a students that it was okay to engage in these practices. And they engage in different activities such as problem scoping or the design of a socially oriented problem like the border wall and how will they address humanitarian crisis um, and economic issues in those settings. Um, <clears throat> and what I did is that I took a subset of the 196 students and randomly assigned them in a bilingual context with a person of color who was bilingual or in an English only context with a white man. Um, and they both groups designed, designed something so um, in like simple, like a toaster oven. First, without any cues about cultural language other than having a person that identifies as a Spanish speaking Latinx speaking in Spanglish or a white man identifying speaking only in English. So the only thing that changed was the language. And after they did the first design, we prompt them with explicit instruction to incorporate cultural and language factors in their work. We preemptively activated their knowledge by asking them to play with this kind of activity where they put in a quadrant different chanclas, flip-flops that are highly associated with Latinx culture as a uh, symbol of weapon or jokes and a lot of other things. It's, yeah, I, I would need another presentation to explain that. Um, and we use some uh, words that are popular in different communities, uh, Latin American communities like guarache, chancla, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and adjectives. So they play with this, they explain us why they thought something will be cultural or a cultural or why they will like it or not. And of course, the ones who were in English did it all in English and the ones who were in bilingual did it bilingually. We presented the problem in the same situations, bilingually or in English. And all we asked them was, what features would you consider when designing a toaster oven and without any other explanation? What we found was that bilingual students were actually better at coming up with a greater number of sketches and also a higher level of sketches, meaning their sketches show three-dimensional uh, shapes and they also show measurements. Those in both languages also generated more ideas at the very beginning. Um, but at the end, both students, when they were explicitly asked to incorporate cultural language, they generated an equivalent number of ideas. So meaning that one way that we can foster this is by having people who come from these communities actually draw from the cultural and language knowledge of the communities and cue that to students or, and or having explicit instruction to incorporate cultural and language um, features in engineering design. And this is an example of the English group where one of the students um, talk about incorporating where, where the students were more broad and less specific about the features that they were describing. For example, let's have a toaster oven that has um, features that are minimalistic like, and simplistic, like apple, what you see on the top. But in the bilingual group, the students talk about dash lines and they connected that with patterns that were used in the Mayan culture and how they have a certain kind of religious affiliation with the sun 
and, and the heat. This is also in the bilingual group and notice how the extent to which they included different language, but also included measurements and details in their, in their toaster oven design. This is another example where they included tortillas and different kinds of uh, items that were going to be warm up in this toaster oven. When we asked them explicitly to incorporate cultural language, we also saw a shift in the ways that English stu students who were in the English only condition, they expanded the kinds of features and elements that they included in their design. And we won't have time for showing another video of the undergrads, but um, the message that I want us all to walk away with is that um, we need to think about these learners and the language practice and cultural practices of their communities as total systems, not as two people inside one mind. And that all of these systems are interconnected um, and that there are relationships between them and that we need to find ways to honor this in the ways that we imagine learning environments. And that those ways don't need to be dependent on a standards or monolingual native speaker norms. Um, but we should consider the whole mind and the whole ecology of these communities when we are thinking about uh, engineering and science learning environments. And then we need to come back to this question of is the language practices of communities a problem to be overcome or a power that is just reserved for the very few, the privileged? And at the end, I just want to make clear that I am not arguing with my research against um, English, the English language, nor I am arguing against the nomenclature of science and engineering. But instead, I am inviting us to be inspired by the realities of communities of color and incorporating those realities into how we do, how we think, and how we engage in engineering and science. And I think we will not only be doing that for broadening participation of these communities, but that would actually result in better solutions that will meet the needs of the majority of the population for the challenges that we are actually facing. Um, that's my presentation for today. And thank you so much. I'll, I'll hang around in case there's any comments or questions. I just want to say thank you, Dr. Perez. Um, I, I just thought your presentation was fascinating. Um, I've never heard it, uh, the way in which you have described your presentation um, in those terms. So you, you've given me a lot to think about. Um, when I think of language and linguistics um, and you know the diversity that is within that arena and how um, it is advantageous that we see the whole person versus separating it out. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you. Thanks to you too for, for sharing those thoughts because I, I will be very transparent with you. Often when I started this work, I wonder, um, I, I, I looked around and, and noticed that not a lot of people were doing this kind of work. And I wondered to myself, is, is this something that, why people don't care about this? And mm -hmm. I, I thought, well, maybe I am absorbed in my own thoughts as someone who, who is bilingual, um, who have been told that, uh, that and in, in, in seeing that my students have been told they are not as smart or they don't have everything that it takes. Um, and, and I see it everywhere, how the languages are ranked in the bo bosses when, and, and, and those are so inoffensive, uh, a small cues uh, that people get, um, yet we, we have it all around us. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not a deficit, it's actually an asset, right? Yeah. And that's the way we really actually should view it and think about it. Yeah. Um, and especially with young children who are just beginning their academic journey, 
um, to be at that age, to be already told in certain ways um, that it's a negative, like I can't use my language, whatever the language is, right? Mm -hmm. that, they, they take that all the way through their academic journey, right? And they, they themselves start separating themselves, not even knowing that they're doing it in some forms. Like you said, the audience is really important, right? Mm -hmm. Who they're saying it to or yeah. not saying, or not, you know, um, speaking their native language. Yeah. And, and there's so many repercussions. Like I remember taking a course with John Rickford. Um, um, a, he's a linguist and he brought people who came, for example, from courts and said that a lot of people don't um, call their Miranda right, rights because they don't exactly said the things the way they are expecting it to be said. Um, so they, they, they are not protected. Um, or I, I think it was Tre Trevion Martin case uh, where some people, their arguments were um, um, like diminished in court because of the ways they talk. And we, we read the transcript and that was just heartbreaking. And, it is. And, and sometimes when I wonder why I do what I do and why does it matter, then I go back to those and try to establish those connections. And, and think that there is a bigger a scheme of things that we are thinking about. And, and I would love to keep talking about these things with people I know. like all of I'm you. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's so fear. good. It's so you good. Know, it's so good. Not, no just worries. One, just one more thing, like the fear, <laughs> the, the fear that's being developed in these young children mm -hmm. that they cannot be their authentic self to me is frightening, mm -hmm. right? because they carry this fear all the way through their own adulthood and through their own development, not only academically, but personally as well. So it, it's, uh, yeah, I'll stop there, but, but yeah, your, 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 your presentation was fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, there's hope instead until there's people like all of oh, you yeah. hope. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's always hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> uh, Dr. Perez, this was great. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Amanda. You're welcome. How do I say your name? Oh, it's Rainsboro. Rainsboro. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I got it. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for your time today, Grace. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. This is and funny. I would definitely be in contact, all right? Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending. And uh, look out for an announcement and email for the next one coming up. We have one more left, all right? Sounds good. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye.